Hello again, friends, colleagues, and new faces. Welcome to the second World CRISPR Day 2021, presented by Syntego. My name is Kevin Holden, and I'm the head of science at Syntego, and I'll be your host today for this virtual event. Last year's event, the first World CRISPR Day, was a fantastic success, and we're excited to be back with another incredible lineup of talented scientists joining us today from five different countries and representing 13 different nationalities who are excited to share with you how they're utilizing CRISPR genome engineering technologies. Our central theme this year is editing for the future of medicine. And our speakers today will demonstrate how they use CRISPR gene editing to generate new life-changing cell and gene therapies, to study diseases and more rapidly develop new medicines, and to generate new innovative technologies that will enable the next generation of genome engineering tools and therapies and diagnostics. We're very grateful that you've all chosen to join us today on this journey of scientific discovery. So thank you to the more than 10,000 scientists around the world who registered to participate today. Just like last year, that's a truly astounding number, and it speaks to both the impact and the interest in genome engineering technologies. We hope that everyone attending today will find World CRISPR Day a useful and educational experience. Now to briefly go over today's World CRISPR Day schedule. First, we're excited and honored to be joined by Theodore Ernoff of UC Berkeley and the Innovative Genomics Institute for a special keynote address titled, Imagine CRISPR Cures. Then our first session for the day will fo focus on how CRISPR technologies are being utilized to generate novel cell and gene therapies from preclinical proof of concepts to clinical trials in human patients. Our second session today will focus on the use of CRISPR in disease research, from mapping protein interaction networks for infectious disease, to generating more accurate models of disease in stem cells and animal models, to building platforms for immuno-oncology drug discovery. Our final speaker session will focus on the development of new genome and transcriptome engineering tools that will help to enable the next generation of gene editing tools and safety measures, therapies, and diagnostics. This will be followed by a special panel discussion focusing on the personal journeys and challenges of some amazing women scientists who are pioneering CRISPR research, developing gene editing standards for research and clinical use, defining CRISPR technical excellence, running gene and editing core facilities and building new CRISPR companies. And I'd also like to let you know that in between our sessions today, we'll be featuring some exciting live entertainment with some fantastic musicians and artists. So before we get started with World CRISPR Day, I'd first like to introduce Paul Dabrowski, co-founder and CEO of Syntego, for a short introductory talk to help orient us around today's theme of CRISPR gene editing for the future of medicine. I've had the pleasure of working with Paul for the past five years, who I would describe as a visionary, a technologist, and a remarkable engineer with a passion for science, and with a passion for enabling greater accessibility of cell and gene therapies to improve human health through genome engineering technologies. Under Paul's leadership, Syntego has developed into a successful scientific and commercial organization of more than 350 employees whose platform technologies are accelerating biopharma research and development from basic research to the clinic. Paul holds an undergraduate degree in computer engineering and mathematics and a graduate degree in electrical engineering. Before Syntego, Paul was the lead digital designer for the Falcon 9 rocket and Dragon X, Dragon spacecraft at SpaceX, and also developed the world's smallest electron microscope for DNA sequencing. Since then, we're all glad that he's trained his engineering mindset and unique skill set towards enabling gene editing technologies. And now he's going to tell us a little bit about the important role that CRISPR is playing in editing for the future of medicine. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone from across the planet. I'm Paul Dabrowski, CEO of Synthigo. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to you all for our second World CRISPR Day. Thank you for joining us. And I'd also like to specifically thank our distinguished speakers who took time from their busy schedules to share their latest work in this cutting edge uh, field. During the first World CRISPR Day last year, we received overwhelming support and interest from the genome engineering community in a virtual conference, making it the biggest CRISPR event of the year. I'm thrilled the interest has continued into 2021 as well, and we're humbled to have over 12,000 registrants join us to celebrate the wins of genome engineering 
and together make predictions for what the future holds. While we chose to keep the event virtual for our, uh, safety purposes this year, I hope the difficult times that we're all going through continue to improve so we have an opportunity to come together as a community with an in-person gathering for next World CRISPR Day. The theme for this year's World CRISPR Day is editing for the future of medicine. We, est we especially highlight curative cell and gene therapies as this new class of medicines represents the transformative potential of the future of drugs and an incredible good that is possible in transforming the lives of literally hundreds of millions of patients. However, we, before we speak about the future, let's briefly contextualize our discussion with a highly abbreviated look into the history of cell and gene therapies and understand where the field is heading. The possibility of gene therapy was alluded to as early as the 1970s, soon after recombinant DNA technology was introduced. In fact, David Baltimore wrote in 1978, many instances of blood disorders, mental problems, and a host of other disabilities are, trans are traceable to a malfunctioning gene. It would be a triumph of medicine if the effects of such genes could be countered. But it wasn't until 1990 that the first gene therapy trial on humans was performed. NIH researchers successfully treated a four-year-old girl for a rare genetic disease. As you can imagine, the success of a trial brought an atmosphere of optimism to cell and gene therapies. However, there was a turbulent journey ahead. In 1999, the death of an 18-year-old patient in an experimental gene therapy at UPenn resulted in significant concerns that the field was moving ahead too quickly and development slowed for the next several years. Over the coming decade, gene therapies made a gradual comeback with wins coming in the form of therapy approvals. Um, gen design for cancer was approved in China. Neovascular gen for peripheral artery disease in 2011, Glybera for 20, in 2012 for treating ultra rare diseases and lipoprotein lipase deficiency in Europe, and cellular immunotherapies were introduced. As the pace of progress accelerated the past several years, confidence has increased there are currently more than 1,000 modified gene trials, uh, gene modified trials underway. So what changed? As the science and technology has matured the past decade, high efficiency therapies and delivery methods, both viral and non-viral, have led to safer outcomes, including nove uh, notable developments in particular enabling the cla a class of ex vivo gene therapies or cell therapies, where quality checks can be performed on engineered cells prior to reintroduction into the patient. In parallel, CRISPR was introduced to the world in 2012, ushering in the possibility of precision genome editing across the entire human genome. While many of the prior therapies relied on introducing a functional copy of a gene into a, into a cell to counter the ill effects of mutations, CRISPR presented the ability to actually fix the root cause by precisely repairing, restoring, or removing the disease-associated gene. This opened up a plethora of opportunities for treating several diseases. And in just a short while, as CRISPR is less than a decade old, CRISPR-engineered therapies made it to trials, the first one in 2016. We're already starting to see the success stories that foretell a promising future. In 2020, Victoria Gray's story is an example. At 34 years old, she is the first patient to participate in the CRISPR therapeutics and vertex sickle cell anemia treatment and she's now uh, av uh, able to avoid blood transfusions and pain attacks without major side effects ever ha after having dealt with those challenges her whole life. Then there's the recent promising data from Intellia's in vivo trials in patients. So today there are already 51 ongoing registered CRISPR cell and gene therapy trials for different diseases, and we at Synthego are seeing a significant acceleration in those underway. This isn't surprising because CRISPR and cell and gene therapies are incredibly complementary. Consider the set of characteristics unique to cell and gene therapies. Importantly, they can be curative medicines. While most drugs alleviate symptoms, cell and gene therapies have a unique potential to address, address the root cause. They also have platform potential for standardization of thousands of medicines to be developed. Since there are thousands of targets across the spectrum of diseases, and cell therapies have the opportunity to include modular processes with a high degree of validation, safety may be turned into a standardized profile. Over time, as the platform matures, 
Different modular approaches uh, for components and modifications can enable high precision, high efficiency clinical results. Simultaneously, the features that make CRISPR a valuable molecular tool, durable genomic editing, programmable guides, um, make this amenable to many different genome-wide edits to target many different diseases. Predictable and, uh, and consistent outcomes allow for high efficiency genomic modification and precise control of on-target editing, features essential for the safety of a therapy uh, are, uh, are something that exists within CRISPR. So with the complementarity of cell and gene therapies in, in that application and the CRISPR technology, we can take a look at the elements that unlock the potential of thousands of new drugs. Industrialized tools that enable the rapid translation of early stage prototypes into the clinical setting in a safe and efficacious manner and a simplified environment for scaling from one to many patients are really the key challenges right now. Rapid translation requires predictable, high efficiency results and outcomes for high quality. Quality standards to, uh, to validate the results uh, make this more stra straightforward for translation. And tunable safety and dosing so that the desired therapeutic profile can be achieved rapidly is very important. In order to scale to many patients, there is a fundamental shift in drug manufacturing. A tightly integrated, high, uh, tightly integrated supply chain, a high throughput scalable automation system, and consistent manufacturing with cons controlled processes and real-time analytics are essential. With this level of challenge ahead of us in the field, I'm very proud of the team at Synthego. We've been hard at work in the world, of, uh, in the CRISPR world, with a relentless pursuit on creating platforms that can help unlock the potential of CRISPR-based cell and gene therapies. Our genome engineering platforms, Halo and Eclipse, are set up to deliver unprecedented scale and quality to support researchers from bench to clinic. Synthgo's unique blend of engineering, biology, and automation enables us to industrialize CRISPR tools for agile development. We've strived to lead by innovation, including continued improvements of CRISPR safety with a tunable switch for, uh, and methods for reducing off-target effects. Synthgo's mission is to support increased access to medicines. Our GMP manufacturing cap capabilities are continuing to increase and are a great example of our commitment to this space. We will continue this pursuit of simplifying the translation and scaling of CRISPR-based medicines. We know that the pace of cell and gene therapies progress will continue to increase. In fact, Scott Gottlieb, the former FDA commissioner, predicted that by 2025, the FDA expects to approve 10 to 20 cell products, cell and gene therapy products per year. This is a dramatic change in the drug landscape. For example, there were a total of 53 drugs approved by the FDA in 2020. So at similar rates, we could expect one third of medicines in the near future to be cell and gene therapies. With the current growth rate, and the evolution of CRISPR, I would go one step further to predict that the proportion of CRISPR-mediated cell and gene therapies uh, will be much higher in the upcoming years. However, with this uh, in mind, the key question is about impact. How many patients will be able to get access to these and when? With the industrialization of CRISPR cell therapies, with the emphasis on quality and safety, I'm optimistic that low-cost, democratized therapies will become a reality, and millions of patients' lives will be improved with these groundbreaking personalized medicines. Mark these words. What we decide to do now with CRISPR will shape the future of the world for centuries to come. All right, so it's my pleasure uh, now to introduce our keynote address uh, for today. Um, and we'll be hearing from Dr. Fyodor Ernoff, who is the professor of genetics, genomics, and development and the director for technology and translation at the University of California, Berkeley and the Innovative Genomics Institute. Fyodor is a pioneer in the field of genome editing with a diverse background in academia, industry and the nonprofit sector. Since 2018, he has served as the scientific director of technology and translation at the Innovative Genomics Institute, the IGI. Before this, Fyodor was instrumental in the development and democratization of gene editing technologies. 
particularly during his time at Sangamo Biosciences from 2000 to 20, 2016, where he served as VP of Discovery and Translational Research. It was here that he co-developed and co-named human genome editing at native loci using engineered nucleases. His leadership responsibilities at Sangamo for preclinical research resulted in the first in vivo clinical trial of an engineered epigenome modulator, the first clinical trial for genome editing, and the first genome edited crop. He is the author of more than 70 scientific publications as an, in, as, is an inventor of more than 130 issued and pending US patents related to genome editing and targeted gene regulation technology. So please join me in welcoming to World CRISPR Day, Dr. Fyodor Ernov for this year's keynote address titled, Imagine CRISPR Cures. I'm humbled, truly so, to speak with you today. An essential disclosure of my conflicts of interest, I'm a co-founder, paid consultant, and hold equity in an epigenome editing company, Tune Therapeutics, and I'm a paid advisor to GSK. Uh, the IGI was founded by Jennifer in 2012, essentially 10 years ago. Um, her paper with Emmanuel had this remarkable gel that showed that you can program Cas9 to cut at five different positions uh, by swapping out the 20 nucleotide sequence. Uh, Jennifer and Emmanuel uh, graciously credit uh, previous editing efforts and then propose um, an alternative methodology that could, quote, offer considerable potential for gene targeting and genome editing applications. That that's an, the, has to be the understatement of all time. Um, CRISPR is in the clinic. Uh, it's the same toolkit, uh, but the targets are different. So this is essentially uh, Jennifer's and Emmanuel's gel reduced to clinical practice. Um, we have magnificent data for sickle and from CRISPR therapeutics with multiple subjects dosed, no SAEs to date, and uh, Victoria Gray um, experiencing resolution of vasoclusive crisis and having 80% indels in her bone marrow. Uh, beautiful data from Intellia. I believe they've disclosed having dosed six subjects beautiful dose response curve um, and advancement to a higher clinical dose and very exciting uh, recent data for uh, AAV delivery to the eye of Cas9, double cut and uh, no uh, SAEs to date and very exciting evidence of efficacy, including the ability of a person to navigate a maze. This is an important opportunity for me to really congratulate CRISPR, uh, Intelli and Editus, the preclinical team, the clinical team, um, as Kevin alluded to, I've, I've done these kinds of things, uh, filing IDs and watching early clinical development go. This is an enormous amount of work and the, the, you should all be CRISPR and Intelli editors. We are very, very proud. Um, and importantly, of course, in terms of Jennifer's considerable potential statement, here's a portrait gallery. The, the wonderful re reporting from Rob Stein. Here's Victoria. Here's Patrick. Here's Carlene. They're edited. Ast astonishing. Um, Jennifer had this nice review in Nature describing the other ways to edit things and of course, they're uh, all heading to the clinic, whether by Verve or Beam, there's epi editing, uh, there's Prime, other things. The, as as um, Paul just alluded to, this is growing in remarkable ways, amazing. And then of course, there's a companion technology, which is NGS and computation. And recently we saw this amazing news that a, a patient succumbing to severe disease got sequenced in, thir in 13 hours. Wow. So. Um, I'm going to now stop this uh, uh, celebration and uh, say to you that nobody in the field is doing a victory lap around anything other than their Eppendorfs, um, because uh, I'm going to shine a cold light of a reality on uh, the challenge of CRISPR for N equals one disease. And I'll start by explaining who this person is and why she's crying. Her name is Carly Koch. Um, uh, I've spoken about her many times and I choke up every time. So I'll just, just talk through this. Uh, she has a monogenic immune disorder, uh, severe. This is her with her mom discussing who's going to get her toys after her funeral. And this is her praying. And if you read the blog spot about her, it's devastating how much suffering she went through. I believe she got a haplotransplant, and I think she's well. Thank Gregor and Rosalind. Um, so why wasn't she promptly edited to health is my question. And the reason I'm so sort of borderline manic about this is this was in 2015. And I'm here to tell you that by 2011, we kind of knew how to fix that. Uh, obviously, we had the SAE and the Gamma X skip trial, and then just running through this quickly with enormous credits to Ed, Phil, and Mike, currently CSOs at SANA, Bluebird, and Ambus, uh, and you know, too many colleagues to name in a collaboration with Matt Porteous. Um, we co-named genome editing, repaired a mutation that was due to an immune deficiency, built a toolbox using generation one nucleases, but perhaps most importantly, uh, again, Gary, uh, currently at Senti, 
played a key role. We partnered with Bruce Levine and Carl June, dosed the first subjects with edited T cells, 100 subjects dosed no treatment with SAEs. Then Mike um, and Amrita Krishnan and John Zai advanced this to HSBC editing, then dosed the first subject in vivo. And then um, I led the team that ultimately resulted in the first IND4 genome editing in the hemoglobinopathies, which is the year that the first CRISPR trials started. And the reason I bring this up is that sort of the preclinical and early stage clinical pipeline for double strand break driven editing was largely established in the BC era before CRISPR. And some of it is straightforward in green, some of it is expensive and hard, which is in red. And it's about that that I'm going to speak with you today with a specific emphasis on Carly Koch. So, you know, I'm an editor, I've been editing for 19 years. And when I, when I see a story like this, I immediately pull up the browser. Okay, Carly has a mutation in DOC8, and here are the SNPs uh, that cause disease. I actually don't know which, what SNP she has, uh, but I'm here to tell you that based on that framework that I just described, you know, if you want to repair mutation number one in, you know, N73 or mutation number two in glycine 144, because you're switching guides and if you're doing <clears throat> HDR with an oligo, you have to basically remanufacture this. It's a different IND. So you're basically jumping all the way to here in your process. Okay, well, let's just jump there. The problem is it's incredibly expensive. Um, uh, when I joined the IGI, it was an incredible honor to uh, basically inherit amazing work that was led by Jacob Horn and Mark DeWitt in partnership with Mark, David Martin um, and Mark Walters at Children's Benioffs and Don Cohn at UCLA. This is basically OD and driven repair of the sickle mutation. Enormously grateful to the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine to, for this formidable support to get us to IND. And we do have an open IND to the best of my knowledge. We are the only academic group that has an open IND. And I say academic and highlight this number because again, congratulations to so many people in the field. There's a very formidable amount of uh, interest in the biotech sector. And all of these entities, again, highlighting also most recently Graphite, um, are actually putting uh, uh, various flavors of editing into the clinic for sickle and thal. It's a large indication space. Okay. Now let's look at the inherited disorders of the immune system. I'm very grateful to Matthew Kahn, who's an amazing uh, immunologist physician at UCSF who treats children with severe immune deficiencies. But er any errors of uh, fact are absolutely mine. I'm, I'm, I'm just an editor. I'm not a physician. We have now 446 known IEAs that traffic across every imaginable phenotypic feature. To the best of my knowledge, there are zero open US INDs for editing them. But please see talks coming up by Drs. Kavatsa, Santilli, and Kuo about amazing work that they are leading um, across the globe to address, address this question. But that disparity is kind of very profound. Um, and let me just emphasize one pragmatic fact. Um, the cold light of commercial reality for these ultra-rare genomic therapies is relatively bleak as of today. The New England Journal reports a stunning result uh, led by Don and Bobby Gasper, Adrian Thrasher, Harry Malik, you know, really titans of the cell and gene therapy field. They dosed 50 subjects with Lenti ADA skid. Overall survival, 100%. I'm sorry, 100%. And, you know, June 3, uh, Orchard uh, abandons promising gene therapy, this one, for rare immune disorder. And the uh, author says, Orchard's decision is suggestive of the difficulty drug makers can face in turning complex but promising rare disease treatments into a sustainable business. Wow. And Bluebird, who frankly has done some of the best work in the history of gene therapy, their data for sickle, thal, for ALD is just magnificent. Um, Bluebird is winding down its operation in a broken, in what they describe as a broken market in Europe. Okay. So, what that basically says to me is the fact that editing represents an approach to the majority of monogenic diseases in principle doesn't mean that some biotech will take on disease number 823 in practice. And there are 5,000 plus monogenic conditions on OMIMP. So what I'm saying to you, and I described to you this framework that was built in the BC era, that framework for advancing genome editing to the clinic operates at a time scale, you know, three years to IND best case scenario, and cost scale, you know, north of six mil per disease. That's incompatible with either the promise of CRISPR to edit any given mutation, which it can do, or the unmet medical need in severe genetic disease, such as the primary immune deficiencies. So again, uh, any facts of medicine are, any errors of medicine are mine. I was just really affected by um, recent work by Atar Lev, published in the, in the GEM. Uh, this came out in March, 2021. It's, it's a tragedy, frankly. Inherited SLIP 76 deficiency in humans causes severe combined immune deficiency. 
and the physicians and scientists, right, we describe for the first time a skid due to biallelic mutations in this gene. Uh, it's severe. Uh, the child was born normally, an uneventful neonatal course, developed symptoms at two months, transferred to a phenomenal set setting for clinical care at three months of age. They did a haplo at 10 months, and then the, 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 this boy died 30 days after the procedure. And what killed the child is this. It's a, it's a, it's a single a base change in, you know, it's a splice donor in this gene. So as I said, I've been editing for 19 years, and when I read something like this, my favorite website is genomeucscdu. So I pull it up immediately. That's what I've been doing my entire, essentially my entire professional life. And here's the mutation that killed this child. Here's this long gene, and that's the highlight, and that is the mutation. The mutation is transitions to an A. Again, the editor in me clicks one button and pulls up the guide RNA track on the browser. And I can immediately tell you that there is a perfectly robust editing strategy that could have been used, which is take either this guide or that guide, make an oligo that prepares the mutation, put a blocking mutation in the PAM, uh, you know, electroporate this with an SSODN or an AV6. And again, graphite has an um, uh, open IND for this in sickle. You know, the IGI and UCLA, UCSF have an open ID with us for an oligo. Or fine, if you don't want to do that double strand break, fine. Take the latest in, in invention from David Liu and use prime editing. So this could have been done. And so I get all excited. And I start to basically write out a two-month timeline to saving this boy's life. Okay, uh, two months. Uh, so week one through dosing patient. So guides can be synthesized super fast. So can oligos. Uh, and we could use an off-the-shelf SPCAS9. We can do potency really fast in, HS in healthy HSPCs. Thanks, Shengdar and Keith and everyone for developing great safety assays. They can be run very fast. We can make a proxy cell line very quickly to show that we can correct the cell defect. You know, we could have a, a manufacturing a process for electroporation of HSPCs that's basically agnostic to the guide and the, and the repair template. So quickly show we can do at scale engineering with those reagents then have a dedicated regulatory process. Um, and then once we're done with all this, after eight, eight weeks, uh, we harvest cells from the patient, manufacture the cells, release the product, and we do this in a dedicated manufacturing so we can dose the patient. Yay! So um, obviously, one divided by yay. Uh, this is a complete non-starter, absolute and complete non-starter, for reasons that would take me a day to tell you. You have to make all the critical reagents at full GMP. Um, in order to do safety, the current regulatory standard is you have to manufacture a toxlock using the final process. Then you do a three to six month safety study in NBSGW mice. Uh, you have to do as part of PD many, many things, including three engineering runs. Um, there is no regulatory process that uh, can happen this fast. Right now in the US, you have to do a pre-IND, an IND, and then the agency has 30 days to let you get going. And to the best of my knowledge, I'm unaware of a single example in the genome editing space where cells have been dosed fresh. So the way that's currently done is you cryo the cells, you release the cell product, and it takes quite a while, and then you dose. In other words, this is just, no, no. But here's the story, right? The status quo, there is no viable path to a two-month CRISPR treatment to a dying boy or any child, is acceptable to no one. Not the patients, not the families, not the clinicians, not the CRISPR community, not the regulators. And Biotech is doing spectacular work, and I salute them. But they're not focused on this problem because the current framework, again, which was developed between 2006 and 2018, really works. Folks, we need a fundamentally new CRISPR for N of 1 framework. It's, an, it's a very simple, it's a, an issue of health justice. And I can say this better than Amanda Gorman, who magnificently said, we have to merge mercy with might and might with right. What does that mean in practical terms for editing? Well, let me speak with you about the Innovative Genomics Institute, which was founded by Jennifer, and I'm honored to work here. Um, it's a, a science with a social purpose. The profound quote that drives us all is Jennifer's. We have a responsibility to pursue CRISPR's in enormous potential to achieve previously impossible solutions to some of the world's biggest challenges, solutions that will be available to anyone. So let me walk you through a vision and action at the IGI, uh, not with the goal of sort of saying, oh, the IGI is great. I, mean, I think so. But with the goal of showcasing that this can be done and this has to be done and this has to be scaled up. So first, I cannot thank more deeply and strongly Timothy Yu and Julie Vitarello for having the ASO field blaze an astonishing path for us editors. They are doing 
extraordinarily impactful work. You're all familiar with the story of how Dr. Yu and the team, driven by this extraordinary human being and the fact that her child, Mila, was suffering, they basically, from identifying the mutation, dosed the patient in 10 months, and it took them four months to get from proof, proof of concept to first dose. It's staggering. Um, critically, they're really scaling this up. They've worked with the agency to develop non-clinical testing for antisense oligos for severely debilitating or life-threatening disease. I really, really encourage you to read Stan Crook's magnificent piece, A Call to Arms Against Ultra-Rare Diseases. Um, so what do we, how do we deploy that for CRISPR? Okay, well, we basically convert a line into a circle. What does that mean? So this is the biotech pipeline. It, everything from scratch, you use it for indications with larger numbers of patients. For N of 1, we basically engineer, integrate, de-risk, stereotypical, automated, mutation-agnostic processes that you use for N of 1 in academic nonprofit settings. You know, uh, Paul spoke nicely about, you know, the, the guide synthesis pipeline uh, that you can see in the human nature. Uh, and my point is we need to factorize, industrialize, and then integrate into a quilt every step. It can be done. So the central message to all of you, from me, having had the good fortune of working on this for 20 years now, is we have to get rid of path-dependent solutions. Path-dependent solutions are things that happened in the past for reasons that no longer apply but are still with us. My best example is from Dr. Arika Okrent. She explains that the reason that night and light are spelled with a GH have to do with a 600-year-old solution because Licht and Nacht in German have a CH. Um, read her book, but the bottom line is we could just get rid of them, but we never will. But that doesn't have to be the case in CRISPR for N of 1. Specifically, as you look at the biggest buckets of obstacles, and I really want to emphasize, I am um, not crazy. I've, I've seen this pipeline be built. Th what I'm about to describe can be done. The technologies exist. We need to focus on indication agnostic current key solutions. We need an integrated computation editing pipeline for causative variant ID. In the nonprofit sector, which does not, is not concerned largely with IP, frankly, because we're saving N of one children and there's, you know, there's no commercial, there's nothing commercial here. We, we can use editing strategies that leverage every tool, editing, base editing, prime e editing, epi editing, whatever editing. Um, we need to build pre-manufactured released editor panels, and we need to work with the CMC reviewers at the FDA on new rapid analytics for guide RNA release, rapid. Um, we need stereotypical CMC approaches for given cell types, and this would need re new regulatory perspectives that safely obviate de novo process development. For efficacy and safety, we have to get rid of mouse talks. I'm sorry, we just do, for, because the, the mouse system was useful, but it's not informative. We need better assays, and we need to build them to 2021 grade. Um, we need rapid analytics to release the cell product to allow fresh dosing, and that can be done. And we need next-gen assays to monitor safety and efficacy signatures. So back to imagine CRISPR cures. You know, you may say I'm a dreamer. Uh, let me emphasize, I'm putting it mildly and not, not the only one. The world over, many people are thinking and working towards this. Let me briefly describe the IGI approach, which is sort of the Avengers mode, which is you bring, bring people together with non-overlapping superpowers. I don't have time to do justice for this because I really want to get to the last slide real quick, and I suspect I only have five minutes left. So at the IGI, we specialize in building cross-functional teams, end-to-end -end vertically integrated, and managing, managing them to success. They could be funded by DARPA, by partnership with industry, and, or by generous philanthropic gifts, or in the case of the SICL program, by the CIRM. But the central idea is you pick Avengers based on the unique superpowers they bring. So I'll briefly describe in a second how we've done that for SICL. But if you look at the disease spaces, they're actually really different. We have, you know, radiation injury, neuroinflammation, hemoglobinopathies, neurodegeneration, the central vision of assembling such superpower, super, superhero quilts and forward integrating to scalability is what underlies all of this. And all of this is happening in the nonprofit sector. So the backbone for all of this is a philanthropically supported by a generous gift from an anonymous donor center for translational genomics. Um, it's basically all about innovating, putting into IND, treating, learning, and repeating, with a focus on neuro, uh, the hemo HSCs, but critically building a platform. And our vision is we start with what we can do today, and then as we share our learnings, this will enable deployment in broader settings. Um, briefly, and with that I'm going to wrap up, I mentioned we have an open IND in partnership with UCSF, Mark Walters, and UCLA, Don Cohn, uh, but that's version one. So um, we have collated um, a, an Avengers-style quilt 
to partner with the community and innovate across the entire problem space to ultimately get to an in vivo, uninvasive, affordable, and scalable approach to the hemoglobinopathies specifically, but also broadly in disorders that can be uh, treated by editing the HSPC. And to the subject of the non-overlapping superpowers, I will speak to the work of some of these folks in a second, but I just want to highlight the fact that, for example, we have a, a public relations and community engagement team led by Melinda Kliegman, and we have a CLIA laboratory for high-complexity molecular testing led by Petros Janikopoulos that is building CRISPR companion diagnostics to make treatments and cures safer. So really quickly, um, what kind of innovation? Well, you know, Jill Banfield discovers clades of huge phages, and then she partners with Jennifer to discover this amazing small editor from a huge phage. Sweet is the lore that nature brings, Wordsworth famously told us. At the IGI, we specialize on discovering these and giving them the clinical light of clinical reality. Delivery, delivery, and delivery, of course, is enormously important. Ross Wilson is leading uh, an effort to build self-delivering CASs that could be uh, either ex vivo closed loop or ultimately in vivo administered. And Jamie Hamilton and colleagues in Jennifer Doudna's lab are running an orthogonal work stream. Central to the IGI mission is we're, we're, we're very welcoming to all approaches. L let the best approach go to the first in human. And I really want to uh, bow, frankly, to Alex Marson, who, my comrade in arms. He's the director for the Glass, of the Gladstone Institute for Genetic Immunology, a director at the AGI, who in partnership with Jennifer got T-cell editing to work in RNPs, and then in partnership with Jonathan Essenstein and Brian Shai, is leading an effort to do an N of 1 CRISPR IND for a pediatric patient with severe autoimmunity. And um, uh, to the best of my knowledge, this will be the first CRISPR for N of 1. And the issue is not to be first but to basically blaze a path to understand what the overall framework of the challenges is and address them one by one. Wrapping up, folks, what will this slide look like in 2027? How many N of one humans will we be able to add? Honestly, it is up to us. And closing on the John Lennon theme, you know, we must come together. Um, the only way to figure out how to edit people safely and effectively is to do more clinical development. The only way, that's, there's no other way. And so I'm arguing that N of 1 trials will be broadly informative and enabling. And when I say broadly, er, there's an everybody wins mindset inherent in how we're thinking about this. It's not a zero-sum game with industry. The inverse, uh, larger industry trials will inform N of 1 trials and vice versa. There is going to be a key role for partnership with manufacturers because N of 1 data will inform on reagent performance and enable N of greater than 1. Uh, but we have to vibrantly collaborate with regulatory agencies across the globe. We should learn from the ASO field who are currently questioning everything and getting rid of path-dependent solutions. The precise venue to do this is the academic nonprofit se sector. Let us be inspired by work at Penn, University College London, we'll hear a talk, UCLA, Tiget, San Rafael, Hôpital Necker, Seattle Children's, Children's Boston, Stanford, amazing efforts in uh, Cincinnati Children's, amazing efforts in academic gene therapy ultimately gave us the world of approved gene therapy medicines. We can do this again for N of 1. We have to ultimately build vertically integrated capability centers, daisy chained into the circle. Um, medical ethics are kind of huge. An N of 1 trial will not produce an approved prescribable medicine. This is a giant topic. The ASO community is rapidly tackling this on. We should join them. Who will pay for all this? Well, the only solution I can offer is the one that's available today. Nonprofits, philanthropically powered, including the AGI where I work. Thank you to all those who support the AGI. The Somatic Cell Genome Editing Consortium and ARPA-H offer great examples of sources of federal support. And here in my home state of California, the CIRM, of course, has been magnificent. Last slide. Leonardo drew this flying machine. Um, he had the right idea. It took a lot of work, but ultimately, this is what commercial flight looks like. Everybody agrees that this is what we should do for CRISPR. I think N of 1 is a phenomenal place for us as a community to come together and make this happen in the next five to seven years. And I will close by saying this is going to be hard. There are so many things unsolved. I'm just going to close with a quote from the United States Marine Corps, which I think is the mindset we should adopt. We should be brave. And what's courage? Courage is not going into a room full of fear and afraid. It's being afraid and still going in. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you, Fyodor, for that very eloquent and inspiring talk, um, really helping us to realize the promise of CRISPR-based cell and gene therapies. Um, 
for you know making life changing uh, curative uh, treatments. Uh, we do have a couple of questions from the audience um, that uh, I'd like to put to you, if that's okay. So, um, uh, the first one we have is from uh, Anna, uh, and she asks um, for the current approved and upcoming CRISPR gene therapies and trials. Are they paid by the patient or are they paid through public funding in the United States? And how does this vary around the world? Yep. So I can speak to the U.S. So the cost of the clinical trial where the sponsor is, is a for-profit entity such as a biotech is, is, is carried by the sponsor. Um, I can tell you that for academic efforts, uh, you either fundraise philanthropically, and that is pretty much what um, uh, um, Alex Marson has had to do to fundraise for his effort uh, on uh, the rare T. regopathy. Um, there's institutional level support, for example, at UCSF. Um, there is also here in the state of California, the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine has actually paid for clinical trials. I think you raise it, um, and the, the question raises a key point. The costs are not scalable. The only way to bring the costs down is to develop these higher throughput automated solutions where it can, it cannot cost this much. Um, whether or not ultimately we're going to be able to get insurance to pay for these end of one treatments, I think is a topic of active discussion. And again, the ASO community is leading on this. Okay, great. Um, thank you for that. We have a, um, another question from David um, and he asks, um, many of the early concerns surrounding CRISPR were um, as to the intellectual property of the initial players in the space. Um, additional concerns followed with many key scientists founding multiple companies. Uh, to what degree has this issue been removed as an overhang for the companies in the space? So if, if I understand, the, so I can give you a bigger, bigger point. The only way ultimately that CRISPR will become a cure for common disease is by large-scale industrial involvement, period, end of paragraph. And I really see the future of CRISPR as a medicine for cardiovascular, oncology, neurodegenerative, at really planetary scale. Only, only biotech and pharma can do this. What I'm arguing for is right now, we have this extraordinary opportunity for multi-level academia, nonprofit industry partnerships as we together become the tide that lifts all boats towards that future. Ultimately, I do think that the end of one space will probably remain in academia and nonprofit, whereas I think biotech should absolutely focus on the more common, common, common indications. I hope I answered the question. Yeah, I think so. Um, it's, it's definitely a complicated area right now. Um, so I think you navigated that quite well. Um, we, we did also, we did have a question actually, I believe about the end of one. Um, but uh, let me get to that first, and then uh, we had a couple, just one more question we'll do. So how does the N of 1 compare with diseases that fall under the Orphan Drug Act? Um, what in the regulatory framework needed to be changed? I think to me, it's less a question of what umbrella term we put over the regulatory path and more a question of time. Whatever we call this, there are pragmatic settings where, you know, 70% of monogenic disease manifests themselves in uh, infancy. We have the pragmatic framework that whether for acute disease or rapidly regressing disease, we have months to do something enabling for the child's welfare. Whatever we call that, um, we have to take a very hard look for N of 1 as how we balance the essential need to be safe with the pragmatic fact that we cannot spend, you know, four months releasing an ancillary reagent through QAQC if in that mean in that window of time the child has died. So whatever the the words we put over the regulatory framework, speed to outcome uh, developed with maximal safety and full ethical considerations should be the guiding light. Okay, and uh, just to wrap up our, our Q and A with you, Fyodor, um, I've got a, a funny, a fun one here for you. Um, you talked about uh, bravery, superheroes, um, and I, I think that's actually the right mindset. Um, you know, that's that's who the the genome engineers are today, um, who are uh, enabling these uh, therapeutics. Mm -hmm. um, so, based on that, what uh, what superhero, what Avenger or X X Man is still missing for this model to work? Oh my goodness. You know, honestly, collectively as a community and a, a field, 
I think we have all the superpowers we need. What needs to happen is we actually, you know, again, I'm, I can't believe I'm quoting the Marvel Cinematic Universe. There, there, there needs to be an Avengers Unite mindset, right? Where there are leadership voices, again, I'm honored to work with Jennifer, that summon the right constellations of superpowers for programmatic initiatives of that scale. Um, so I honestly think it's not about an individual human. I think it's about our collective realization that we're dealing with an issue of health justice that we as a community can um, impact within the next five, seven years. All right. So it sounds like we, we need all the Avengers to, to assemble on that theme. Okay. So um, I want to thank you again, Fedor, for, for joining us um, uh, this morning for the, a very eloquent and informative keynote. Um, and I think it's a really uh, perfect segue um, into our first session today, um, which is um, actually on cell and gene therapy. So um, we'll be right back um, uh, just as we wrap up here and we'll be uh, segueing into uh, the, the next session. So uh, thank you again, Fyodor, and um, we'll look forward to seeing you, all of you in the next session on cell and gene therapies. Mm -hmm.